Welcome to the third lecture in Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's series entitled, We Have Lived in Southeast Since Time Immemorial. I am Chuck Smythe, Director of the History and Culture Department. SHI has started construction of its arts campus in downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit sealaskaheritage.org slash campus. The title of today's lecture is Evolution of Northwest Coast Art. As you watch the lecture, we invite you to submit questions in the chat box on YouTube. Mr. Brown has graciously agreed to answer questions at the end of his presentation. Steve Brown is an independent researcher, author, and artist focused on the Northwest Coast art tradition for all of his adult life. He has been involved in large-scale carving projects in Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, and Washington State, and has authored several well-received books on the subject, including a soon-to-be-published monograph on Tlingit canoe carving. Mr. Brown. Yes. Welcome. I think I've finished this one adjustment and I'll hit the right button, you know? Where is it? Where's share screen? Why am I not seeing share screen now? You don't see me yet? Hello. Yes, we see you. Oh, you do? You can see the screen? No, I see you. Oh, okay. Because I don't see the thing that says share screen. How do I get it to appear? You'll just want to click on the Zoom window uh, at the bottom of your screen, and it should pop up there. It's not popping up. Really Play. Uh, you still can't see the screen, eh? No, maybe Nick can help you. I just removed and re-granted your permissions to share. Still nothing? Still nothing. It would be in the it Zoom. There a minute ago. <laughs> the share screen, that whole uh, toolbar was there a minute ago. Do you see Zoom in your taskbar at the bottom there? Yeah blue square zoom icon? Um, let's see one. There's the... Oops. Let's see here. Where would it have gone? You need to go back to the Zoom meeting and it should be in there. Oh, okay, now I can go for somehow. There, it was covering up the um, Zoom meeting window itself. Perfect, there it is. Okay. 
Now we're visible, right? Right. Yeah, just hit play now. Play? That would make it automatic, right? But I want to be able to select. So, um, sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, but what I wanted to do is um, just look at some changes that took place over time in the tradition of Northwest Coast Art as we know it. So going back to the earliest um, documented examples, this particular piece of wood uh, is, was excavated in the uh, an archeological dig in the Prince Rupert Harbor area in the mainland of British Columbia uh, by uh, a project headed by the late um, George MacDonald. And they dated this at 2000 years old. Uh, don't know what it is. It appears to have two little uh, tenons on the bottom. So it, it might have attached to something. It may have been a handle. It may have been a, a embellishment on a, a mask or any uh, other kind of a thing you might be able to imagine. But it is wood and it does have some uh, negative shapes cut out, one in the form of an oval. And, and it's really an oval, not an ovoid because it's more or less the same top and bottom as side to side, more or less. And there's a large uh, beveled cut that appears to represent a mouth and a little trigon type shape that seems to delineate an ear. And there might be something down here in what you'd call the snout, I don't know. And this uh, coiled business here at the other end, I don't know what that's about. But, and this doesn't mean that this is the oldest piece of this uh, visual tradition either. It just means it's the oldest one so far discovered. And because most of this is involved in wooden objects, there are very few that have survived to be able to represent themselves. Uh, this being one of them, it's obviously wood. It was apparently in a wet site so that it, it survived through uh, the centuries. And then um, why does it go from one to seven? What happened to two, three, four, five, and six? Oh, there are mysteries in this. In this uh, business, but I'm missing a couple of objects here. If you click that left or right pointing arrow on that first slide, it will collapse and you should see some more slides there. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, here's number two. So this is, um, I'll make it fit better here. It is a bone comb. And it, um, as you can see in the um, little description that goes with it, uh, it's dated 800 to 1,000 years old. It's again print, excavated in Prince Rupert Harbor or thereabouts, and is dated between one and two thousand years old. Although this is eight to one thousand, but um, again, we see incised lines in the surface that define certain kinds of shapes. So uh, this is the opposite side of the same column here. The teeth are all busted off, obviously. But this is appears to be a long, narrow 
ovoid type shape with two opposing trigons being the little triangular shaped thing like this. And then there's other trigon shapes within and another oval up here at the top. The other, um, we look at both, the drawing of both sides. So we were just looking at this side. And so here's that appears to be an eye, but it's just formed by two opposing trigons, which is a, a very old way of doing it. And it's the basis for eyelid lines and eye forms within ovoids that we see today in, a, in a diff some different appearance. So here's another a pair of trigons along one side and what appears to be one coming up this way, an oval here, a, a stack of two, what uh, some people would call split U's, two uh, trigon forms within U shapes and another like half an eye there. So there doesn't in this case appear to be much representation in terms of a, of a interpretable creature, but, uh, and, and we don't know what context this had in the culture of its day either, but um, it does sort of show uh, the status of this incised artwork at a certain point in time. So just for a second, uh, because I'll be talking about um, ovoids and form line weight and all that kind of stuff. Pardon me while I just um, throughout here. I thought I'd put these up just to illustrate here are two different form line ovoids. Uh, one of just slightly changing thickness. So uh, the late Bill Holm, to whom I am indebted for um, most of this information and the language that we use to discuss it, um, but he used the word form line because they change thickness. And then there's uh, a word that he doesn't use or didn't use, but that I like to use, fine line, which is just a, uh, a single line of even width, very thin line. So this form line is thickest on the top, thinnest on the bottom, and somewhere in between on each side. But they can vary in proportion. So here's one, a very much thicker form line, very much thicker on the top, and in this case, much thinner on the bottom. But in in a lot of old work, by old I mean before 1800 and, and in that general span of time, uh, the whole form line would be thicker all the way around. So it might have similar proportion to this relative to the top, bottom, and sides, but the, the entire form would be thicker in, in uh, nature. And, and that comes about really just because of the way negative spaces, this internal ovoid being the negative space, the painted area, the positive space, whether it's painted or whether it's just carved, that is the positive space remains on the surface and the negative space within an ovoid form line within a U shape or whatever is the part that gets carved away. So just so we all uh, are on the same page regarding that. And then um, this is a, um, just a little uh, design that I uh, put together one time that uh, illustrates the steps taken in producing a carved and painted Design, just squeeze it a little bit more, try to get it in here. There we go. So, 
this is, and this, uh, I did this years ago for the uh, Alaska State Museum there in Juneau. And um, it had to be in four sections. So these are hinges so that that can be folded up into a smaller package. It's about, oh, two and a half feet wide altogether. And uh, so it folds up to fit in a certain kind of container that they use or used, I'm not sure what the status of it is now, to uh, distribute to schools. And so this could be opened up and put on display. So it shows the first step, and that is painting the design, the primary form lines, the main form lines, that is to say, on the wood. And this is done just with a paintbrush. There were no pencils back then, of course. And so they would start with a paintbrush and begin laying out parts of the design and building from one to another. And so you, usually that's the ovoids that are the building blocks. But so here, um, here's the main form lines painted. I've also included the fine lines in this case, the eyelid line surrounding this ovoid. And, and you can see that as two opposing trigons, just like we saw in that ancient comb. They're just a little more sophisticated. So it comes tapered, it's a wider trigon, but it's still two opposing trigons with and rather than a circle. In this case, it's an ovoid shape within. And that ovoid has been elaborated in order to uh, break up the space. So, and the fine line here surrounding the inner ovoid, what Bill Holm called the tertiary line, because he was, uh, he had come up with the designation of primary form lines, which in this case are black, and they define the entire design. And then the secondary is, the, in this case, the opposite color, in this tradition, red. And those are similar form line elements, but they're contained within primary form lines like this unit here. Um, I'm coming to a question now. Can, can observers here, can you see the curse, my cursor? So yep. you, yeah, we can see that fine. You can see the cursor? Okay, good. So, um, so then the next step, if, if this is to be relief card, is to relief card. So the first panel is just painting. The second panel is primary painting with secondary painting along with it. So this is just a painted ovoid with a, a U-shape between and fine lines that fill in the space around that other negative space. And uh, another, what Bill would call subsecondary ovoid or U-shape within the secondary. So it goes back to the original primary code and occupies this space. So that, and the same with this one, it's black within red, within black. So that's sub-secondary by his definition. And then the next step is to relief carve. So all the unpainted areas, so all this unpainted area here gets carved away. And the light on this isn't perfect for seeing that, but you can tell that this space is carved, the space around the inner ovoid there is carved. This space is carved on either side of the trigon. This ovoid is hollowed out, this area is hollowed out. And these eyes have been relief carved as well. And the area around this eye has been carved out. That's easier to see. You can see the shadow of the relief carving there and, and here. And you can see that on this side, 
the ovoid was just painted solid black. But there's a sort of unwritten rule that says the thickest solid black area should be over the top of the main ovoid, so this here. So this is a larger concentration or width of black than this is. So by the same token, if that was solid black, that would be the blackest large black space on the whole thing. So in order to maintain a certain harmony of positive and negative space, a large area like that get, becomes relieved. So it's broken up into more form lines and it's slowly becoming what has come to be called a salmon trout head. And on this side, we see just an ovoid shaped relief that is a single V cut around an ovoid shape that is only penciled in here. And actually, you can do it this way by painting it black and then carving that out of it. But <clears throat> it it's actually makes more sense. It's easier to paint it this way and then just carve out the unpainted space. But that's neither here nor there. So then once all the unpainted spaces are carved away, that includes these areas between design parts like this trigon shaped space and out here as well. So those carved, certain of those carved out spaces get painted blue green. And so that includes around eyes, around inner ovoids, and the reason, and, and this is what Bill called the tertiary color, primary, secondary, tertiary, one, two, three. And of course, the primary design can be red instead of black, in which case the secondary would be black and the subsecondary would be red. But in either case, the tertiary uh, is always blue. So in this case, this fine line, what he would call a tertiary line, would have called a tertiary line, is uh, what separates, that's what creates this tertiary space. So the secondary doesn't fill the whole area within the primary. It's, it's separated from the primary by this tertiary space. Now, if it wasn't carved, you wouldn't paint the blue you would just have the line and the space between primary and secondary. Then here, there's a secondary element within this primary U-shape and it happens to be a single U-shape with two solid U-shapes extending from it and a small tertiary space defined again by a tertiary line. And within that area, it's painted blue-green. Now you notice um, some of, in some of these cases, these tertiary lines are black and in some cases they're red. And that's unusual. Usually in the tradition, they're always black. But I did notice when I was working with Bill at the Burke Museum in Seattle, a uh, a painted box was in the collection there and more, more than one. And so at least one, maybe a couple of Haida artists made their own little tradition and they made a fine line next to a red element, they made it black and a fine line next to a black element, they made it red. So I've done that here just because I thought that was kind of a cool idea, but it, strictly speaking in the most of the tradition, but that's only one or two Haida artists. In most of the tradition, the tertiary or fine lines are always black. So the ones around the inner ovoid, because the inner ovoid's black, they're black, and they would be anyway. And then um, this fine line, because it's within the red, is, is uh, part of its red, part of its black. Same with this one. So here, the one next to the black is red, the one next to the red is black, so go figure. But anyway, uh, so that's the steps. Paint the primary, paint the secondary,
carve out the negative spaces and then paint the blue green. So um, th this was done in a kind of a early Schlingit style in that the four lines are fairly broad compared to the negative spaces that they surround or they create. So that the, here the negative space around this inner ovoid is fairly small. And here the ovoid and the fine line around it, which is really part of it, are, is fairly big. So the negative space around it's relatively small. And so the, the negative spaces such as these crescents that define the edges of four lines are relatively small. And that's reflected in this object, which is a, um, it's actually a measuring device for uh, measuring chilcat yarn. So, uh, and, and the fringes, partly for measuring, partly for creating the side fringes. So you would take your uh, fringe yarn, wrap it around this end to end. So it's, it uh, wraps between these um, little knobs at each end. And then you can see these cut marks where they cut those uh, surrounding wraps of yarn into separate short pieces. And then those become the side braids. So, and the ends have been decorated with form line elements. But it's interesting to note here that uh, the form lines themselves are so broad because the negative spaces carved out, which is what creates the form lines. We wouldn't see the form lines if it wasn't for these cut out spaces are quite small. Uh, this little slit is, is just barely a little V cut. This is just a little V cut. The mouth is opened up by beveling down to here. There's a narrow little U shape there with a fine line along one edge of it, separated by a V cut. The eye is quite large in relation to the socket. The negative space within this U shape is quite small. And the same here at the other end, uh, uh, a relatively small ovoid creates a big and the space, the placement of this U-shaped element next to it and this crescent on the corner of it define a really big broad four line elements. And this is typical of the 18th century and before. So there's a big jump between the time of this calm and even if this was from the late 18th century, we can only guess that, could be older than that, but it's, it's no older than the Chilcat weaving tradition or even possibly um, uh, Ravensdale robe if it had fringe on it in the same way that a Chilcat robe does. But, uh, Stylistically, we could say that it comes without knowing anything about its history. Otherwise, we could say that it, it most likely comes from uh, deep into the 18th century. So then there are some other dated kinds of objects. This is a pectoral fin on one of the dogfish in the uh, Sheikh's house, cut to hit the dogfish house in Wrangell. This is one of the original house posts. And here's one of the uh, gills of the dogfish and the pectoral fin sticking out along the side of the dogfish's body. And then the same uh, image includes these uh, two uh, octopus, octopi, I guess. And so these are the tentacles and the suckers of the octopus. Um, and there's a four line design composed on that uh, pectoral fin. Uh, so, and again, the negative areas, the space around this 
inner ovoid. It's quite small. The cheek design is set up with a very narrow little recut. Uh, this U shape, quite angular and uh, narrow recut at the base of it, the fine line at the base of the U shape, and the narrow cuts around there, a narrow crescent defining the corner of that U shape, small little circle. Uh, with a V cut around it. Interestingly, on the two sides of this dogfish, uh, this circle appears to be flat across the middle with just a V cut around it. The one on the opposite side, everything else is the same, but instead of being flat across the middle, that whole circle is domed so that it doesn't have this edge on the inside of the V cut. Rather, the whole thing is just a dome. And, and there are some consistency, differences, consistency like that on the rest of the post as well. Something on one side, the same element on the opposite sides are handled slightly differently. So here the form line uh, coming around the eye socket drops down here in the most typical structure, this being then the lower lower jaw, you might say left figure. I'm just gonna let that ring. Um, and then within that mouth, a fine line defined by narrow because. So this is a broad form lines Try to throw that to where we don't make so much noise. Okay. So that's, and this, uh, these posts can be fairly confidently dated to around 1780, 1790, based on other carvings that the same person whose name was Kudges the Uch made. Uh, and that existed in situations where they can they can be dated at least roughly based on the patterns of weathering. So 1780, 1790, and we see the the status of of the form line in terms of width uh, still fairly broad. And then this little um, Seabird, I suppose, is what it is, uh, that was collected in uh, 1774, I believe, on the um, Spanish expedition. This is an illustrated uh, illustration that Billy Bill Holm did, highlighting the form line design on the wing of the bird. So this is a little ivory bird and a woman who came out in a canoe to meet the Spanish ships off of uh, uh, Langara Island in uh, Queen Charlotte's was wearing this little ivory pendant around her neck and uh, the Spaniards on the ship traded for it and ended up in Madrid. Has a broken beak, don't know what kind of seabird it was but it has a form line design, not unlike the, what we were just looking at in proportion. Um, Bill, when he did his drawing, he kind of angled it up a little bit more. These are rounder shapes and he made them more angular, but that's all right. It's just a personal style thing. So we have the ovoid in the wing and there's two small slits that define what you would call a cheek design. So then this form line coming around the eye socket turns down here and touches the lower jaw. And then that form line continues up and around, which is what Bill illustrated here. 
And then, although it's not painted red because it's not painted, that little cheek area is just defined by these narrow slits. The mouth is a relatively narrow slit. And the space around the eye is quite narrow. The eye, ovoid shaped eye with a long trigon point on each end and a raised fine line ridge to define it. That's the tertiary line, the fine line. And the carved out area is quite small. And that's typical of this time frame. And then the circle dot in the eye, circle dot is one of those really old elements that's not really a part of the form line tradition, but it's something that was used to decorate uh, objects going way, way back in various parts of the world. So then, Here's another ivory object. This was a, a whale's tooth hollowed out, flattened on the pointy end so that it would stand up. And this was a, a shaman's cup. So shamans would sometimes drink salt water in order to produce a vision. And they would use a, a fancy cup like this to do it. So this is another example of early style really heavyweight form lines. Again, the eye is basically two opposing trigons with a fine line surrounding the, in this case, ovoid shaped eye. Here, the relief in the eye is just a simple slit, but that's enough to convert it from one big broad positive area to two smaller ones. So then it's, otherwise it would be bigger than this one. Right? And so here we have a tertiary line, a fine line split and hollowed out tertiary space around it, enclosed by a fine line all the way around within a primary U shape. And then the triangular teeth, uh, I'm not sure what this creature or spirit image might represent. We'd have to ask the shaman who carved it. But um, here's an ovoid form line overlapped onto the lower jaw. But again, the, the negative space is really small and the inner ovoid is quite large. The same with this one. Comparatively large inner ovoid for the space that it's in. So the, the carved out tertiary area around it is relatively small. Then this, uh, comb, apparently bone comb. I don't know the uh, collection history of this, but it, was, it doesn't appear to have been excavated, but it might have been. But it got a lot of use. You can see where the hair is worn, grooves in the teeth of the comb. So it got a lot of use over the years. And it has this um, uh, long face, form line face. And again, it has those characteristics of very small negative spaces, two small trigons, very narrow trigon there to delineate the cheek design. Large eye, eyelid line takes up a lot of space, very small carved out, small uh, because around the circle then uh, squared off flat teeth, but broad form lines, very simple, one or two or three, possibly this is really three element secondary area. So there's one solid U shape and two tertiary U shapes hollowed out attached to the end of it, but nothing elaborate. And that was the characteristic of work from before 1800 and the early 19th century and going back into the 1700s or 1600s, we, we don't really know. There are a few objects, there are a few, but there are a few objects with, that can be dated uh, older than that. And we'll have a look at some of them as they, as they show up here. So um, then th this is a, 
interesting chest. I think it's in the Museum of Natural History in New York. And um, obviously very old, just in terms of condition. It has an interesting, um, uh, call it an embellishment or maybe a repair or a reinforcement here. And so on each of the four corners, this is a split quill of an eagle feather, which gives you an idea how small this chest is. I was shocked when I first saw it because it's, I don't think it's a foot, foot wide from here to here. And, and maybe seven inches tall if it's a foot wide. And yet it has a very, what you might say a typical chest design in that there's a large form line face in the center that has a form line going all the way around it, dipping in at the center of the forehead to help create eye socket. So that form line goes all the way down here, turns quite broad, going all the way across the bottom, turns up here quite broad, going across the top of the eye socket. Then there's a separate form line that comes up to form the mouth. And that has little tertiary space carved out within it. And then another separate pair of U shapes to create nostrils. And they come together separated just by a circle and a teensy weensy little trigon and rises up in the middle to create the other lower corner of the eye socket ovoid. And then two opposing trigons on either side of this ovoid shaped eye. And of course it's ovoid because it's flat on the bottom and arched on the top. So it's not an oval per se, like that first object we looked at, but a real ovoid. So it's asymmetrical top and bottom, but symmetrical from side to side. And then there's a fine line, recut, ovoid shaped relief within those eyes, even though they're smaller than the main form line, the carver decided to put that little ovoid shaped relief in there. And then there's another, there's an ovoid here, the form line around this ovoid overlapping or overlapped by one or the other the form line around the face. So here they occupy the same space. The, the ovoid around this, the ovoid form line around this inner ovoid comes all the way up here like this and down like this to here. And that happens to meet the inside edge of the other form line. So they're overlap. And that's, that's a tradition we see right up until today through all the different phases of the evolution of this tradition. So that's something that goes way back. But again, very, very narrow carved out area around it, very narrow tertiary space below that. And then there's a U shape on each side that are sort of obscured by these split feather quills that apparently were put on there to reinforce the corner. I've only seen one other chest, a small chest. Well, actually it's a pretty big one that has a quill repair like this just on the upper part of the corner, the upper three or four inches where possibly the board bent when it was steamed and bent. And the board, I mean, it broke where it was steamed and bent and then repaired but again, using a split quill. And those are the only two examples of that I've ever seen. Uh, what these pegs here were for is hard to say. That might be the remnants of, well, there's four of them across, but maybe even five. But I don't know for sure what those are about. But uh, this is the opposite side of the same chest. And it, it shows instead of eyelid lines, right at the top of the oh, yeah, yeah. Instead of eyelid lines, this just has long, narrow ovoids with long, narrow 
ovoid shape we leave. Here, the one line just dips down as a circle. We leave in the center with a very tiny crescent cut around it. Uh, different cheek design. We didn't really look at this one. So here's the cheek design touches here. It's what uh, Bill coined the term a two step, one step here, one step here, cheek design. And there's just a trigon that kind of breaks it into two elements, a horizontal one and a vertical one. And then this, these cheek designs are different. It's a one step. There's only this drop from the eye socket to the lower jaw, where this has two, one, two. But again, they just used a, a trigon within that space defined by very narrow little V cuts. And then two tertiary U shapes surrounded by fine lines on either side, a very small ovoid up in the upper corner with a little narrow tertiary space here. Rounded teeth, uh, two very solid U shapes just defined by a narrow, narrow cut there and a narrow slit at the base of each. And then the form line coming all the way across the lower part of that head, and up over the five sockets and then come down in the middle. And another figure, well, there's two straight form lines with narrow slits there, coming down to separate what you might call the body with this very, typical 18th century uh, triad of U-shapes. So there's one broad U-shape and two solid ones, absolutely square corners on them, uh, separated by just a V-cut and a narrow slit at the base of each, and then the form line coming down. And this would be technically a secondary element, might have been red at some point with Again, a very large ovoid in a not very big negative space with a very small negative space around it. So what we can see is that, and this goes back even to the comb that we looked at um, in the beginning, that in order, and, and this uh, tool, this blanket weaving tool, uh, in order to create the design, it's just a matter of placing these negative elements in such a way that the form lines around them have certain proportions and certain shape. So this person didn't start by painting these form lines. He started by incising around that ovoid carving it out and then making a recut here to define this ear and front of the snout. Put in this U shape to define this form line coming around this way. Put in this slit to define the form line turning down here. And this slit to define the form line coming around the eye socket to form the bottom jaw. So entirely dependent on where these negative spaces are placed is what determines the form line shapes and the width of the form line, same thing over here. So coming back to this chest, we can see the same thing going on here where uh, a, a minimal amount of wood is carved away because you have to figure this was probably done before there were steel tools. And so this might have been done with shards of shell sharpened or beaver teeth. Uh, and, and it might have had your know, little shards of, of steel that were salvaged from shipwreck or driftwood, something like that. But we don't know how old this is. It could be. But certainly in the 18th century, maybe even in the 17th, and it could be older than that, uh, and just was 
main, you know, I looked after, uh, it might have spent some time under a house or in a grave to get that sort of weathered surface. But um, at any rate, it, it survived from a long, long time ago. So then here's a uh, one side of a box that has a, what uh, people call a corner oriented design. So the middle of the design is on the corner of the box. The mirror image of this design is on the, this side of the box, 90 degrees around this corner. And there's another design on the opposite corner that would be on part of, would be on this side of the box over here. So we're looking at half of the whole design. And this also had a lot of early characteristics. I look at the way the, the trigon or the eyes are cut out that, so that the center of it is the deepest part where later on the center is higher and it's the edges that are cut out. So that's interesting. And it's a double eye, eye with only a little slit, like a mouth across the bottom, narrow little slit. Again, very small negative spaces cut out, small tertiary space around the eye cut out, and an entire plumb line pattern that covers the whole box. So here the one eye above the eye dips down there, comes around the back of the head all the way down to here and across. The two-step mouth, the mouth is a separate form line that just comes down and touches here. The nostril is a separate form line like a half of it or a U shape with the narrowest little slit at the base of it coming to here and a ridge of the nose coming up. This looks like there might be a circle of relief right on the corner of the box. And then a two step, this is one step, two step, according to Holmes' term, cheek design. And it's almost just a big solid cheek design. There's only this little slit to define the upper part and the lower part. Well, the one we saw in that other chest had a trigon here. And this could have been one, but decided not to do it, the artist. And then in this, which would be a secondary area, so there's the ovoid at the bottom here that has, appears to have toes connected to it. So this is part of a foot rather than part of a head. Large inner ovoid, narrow slit relief, angular U-shape there vertically the sideways u-shape overlapped by this one. So the other leg of this u-shape is underneath this. So it's been overlapped by it. And they're separated by just that little dragon shaped space. And there's the fine line surrounding the inside edge of the u-shape, fine line trigon split, and then the hollowed out tertiary space. Here's the fine lines surrounding the entire U-shape, negative space, and then that's hollowed out. Uh, again, a large eye, small carved out area. And so this, this is also probably well into the 18th century. It could be early 1700s, could be even earlier than that, we don't know. This hole is probably for a, a cord that would have help to tie the lid on. And then these holes are from um, what fastened the fourth corner of the box. So this is a bent corner here, and this is the fourth corner that's fastened. And those might have been pegs, peg holes. But early thing. Uh, this little box is in the Alaska State Museum. And it was old and weathered and a, a, a long ago director of the museum decided he would paint the box. So they originally had the paint all worn off. 
but he went ahead and painted the box and painted, used a pretty thick looking uh, bunch of paint to paint in the tertiary areas, very pale green and uh, very small, what you'd call secondary areas. Um, so it's a really interesting form line pattern, really broad form lines again. Uh, no relief here, but there often would be. There might have been the tiniest little inside circle there that never almost all the way away. And then up in the upper corner, it's really the profile of what appears to be a bird. It has a long beak that turns down at the end, but it, it's built just on the structure of this form line face that has a pair of eyes and a mouth. There could be a, a crescent or a trigon here, but there's not. And just like this one, the, that little trigon defines the outer edge of that form line. The outer edge of this form line could be defined here, but isn't. And so there's just this broad tertiary space beneath that eye ovoid and then the little long narrow U-shape turning down at the end with the little solid red area within it. Now that may or may not have originally been red. Uh, it's hard to tell if that's carved out or flat on the surface. If it was carved out, it wouldn't have been red. It would have been another tertiary space. But uh, the long ago directly we painted this, might have just decided to paint red anyway. And here we have the more typical <clears throat> way of carving out the trigons of the eyes, rather than that deep cut we saw on uh, this box in the earlier one, where the center is the deepest part and it's like a broad, wide open V. But this one, it's the more typical eye shape. But this is clearly a very old carving on that box. Um, again, probably at least the 18th century. So then this one, if I remember the story of it correctly, um, this was found on Prince of Wales Island by a forest service worker in the 1970s in the, you know, the cavity of a large hollow cedar tree. And so it had been protected in that cavity for a very long time. And it had, um, I believe there was a skull, there was uh, a rattle, some odd little shaman's figures, but all really, really uh, archaic looking stuff. Uh, and clearly designed on the chest, not very big, it's only probably not two feet across less than two feet across, maybe 22, 20, 20 or 22 inches from side to side. And here we have the, and you notice also that the black isn't that black and the red isn't that red. They're, they're not that much different in color. And that's a, another early characteristic where uh, and I understand that in some cases, a uh, red ochre powder was burned, heated somehow by fire and burned in order to make it black. But you still have the, the mineral characteristic of the pigment to mix with uh, salmon egg for a paint. But it comes out this brownish red instead of black. And that's interesting in and of itself. So it's also interesting that this large face, form line face, double step type where it dips down in the middle, comes all the way down to the lower jaw. Here the lower jaw is almost eliminated. Uh, it's just the tiniest little line left. And it's one of those things where in order to make 
the, the spaces within the head bigger instead of having just sort of wasted space for the width of this line. The artist just brought that right down to the edge. And you see that sometimes on hat paintings as well, where the, uh, some natural border of the hat uh, is used as if it overlaps the bottom jaw, the bottom form line. But then, so we have a two-step cheek design. In this case, it's just solid red, no relief in it at all. Separate form line for the upper lip, you could call it. Two little squarish secondary U-shapes within it. And a very unusual nose with this curl coming this way. And then trigon here, two little small trigons here and another small trigon there. Really unusual nose structure there. And then the eyes, you can see that the whole eye is sort of domed and it's, it's higher here than it is here. So this hollow includes the points of the eye, but the eye itself and the eyelid line are not carved. It's just painted. And that's interesting. These are incised you know, V cuts. But here, that's just painted on the surface. And the blue green is painted up to that line, but not including it. And then not unlike the last one, where what well, was apparently a bird's head is really built in part using the upper form line of this eye socket as the lower jaw of the bird. The same kind of thing is going on here. So here the form line around that eye socket comes down here and is completely overlapped by the form line of the head. So we don't see that as its own form line coming across here, it's overlapped by the head. Uh, simple one step drop, form line coming up around and turning down, leaving the cheek area secondary large inner ovoids, very small negative space, all the same kind of characteristics we've been looking at, ovoid shaped reliefs. And so we've seen slit reliefs and ovoid shaped reliefs so far, and that's all. Uh, red leg and a foot that appears to go with this bird-like image, if this is a beak coming across here, it doesn't turn down. It doesn't really even have an end on it. They're, they're both joined together with just small circles cut out and painted red in the middle. And then a triad of U-shapes, one at the base, tertiary space within it, and two solid U-shapes extending from it. Same thing is going on as what could be the wings of that bird. Square, very square U-shape and two where you see appended to it with two rectangular ovoids going along with the square business, very narrow slits here, narrow trigons here with another triad of one broad U shape and two small ones extending from it. So broad primary form lines, really small, uh, not complex secondary areas, triad of U-shape, this leg and then a U-shape attached to the back of it is all we have here in the way of secondary space. And this is the end of that chest. Really interesting little bird man, I guess you'd call it. So here's one big, really wide form line ovoid with little really triangular trigons in the corners. Eyebrow, separate eyebrow, this is what I would call a mask-like face. So it's not a form line construction. It has separate eyebrows, separate mouth, upper lip and lower lip, and a separate nose. And then the eye sockets hollowed out, painted blue green. And that extends up over the forehead. And then the whole, perimeter of the face is 
relieved, set back a little bit. Uh, and then this odd body shape coming down with an eye turned sideways with a rectangular inner ovoid, like really rectangular, square corner. And then again, a trigon of U shape or a triad of U shape, base one across there, tertiary space within it, and two pretty much solid U shapes extending down with crescent at the base of each one, but they're so long, they have a circle relief in the middle of them. And then a little extending corner on each one that makes it like more like a feathery tip. And then a, a leg with a bird-like foot, not a human hand, and a leg with what uh, just a very minimalist foot there next to it. And that's in the, the brownish red and then red uh, areas just painted on each side. Really, really interesting design. And you can see that this is a telescoping box. So the sides are attached to the top, not to the bottom. So when you lift that up, there's another box inside there that is attached to the bottom. And, and so the two boxes overlap. So it's, the wood is twice as thick here. And that's a, an older kind of a thing to begin with. And uh, something you don't see so often these days. So this is, I think, not this is a different one. Oops, where to go? This is the other side of this one. Okay, I got kind of slightly out of order. This is the other side of the box we just looked at. So you can tell it has the same only painted eyes, ovoid shape relief, but it's not carved, it's just painted. Eyelid line is not carved, it's just painted. But the tertiary space has been hollowed down around it. And the eye itself has a little dome to it. Same with these the ovoids here. They're slightly domed so that the edge of the inner ovoid is lower than the form line around it. And a little small negative space, tertiary space around that. So again, broad form lines, small uh, transitional devices, the trigon and crescents where they exist. They're two-step cheap design, but it's just one big solid red thing. Triad of U shapes here above this ovoid in the lower corner. This ovoid in the upper corner also seems to have a beak attached to it. So I would call that a little turned down beak with an open slit for the mouth. So again, it's a head, bird's head, overlapped by the form line of the head. And then the little triad there, broad form line, two solid ones, square inner corners, rounded outer corner. Interesting 18th century style. And then we see this little triad, triad of U shapes here. There's a line that comes down from the lower jaw to define what you might say the body. On either side of that is just a, a little triad, broad U shape, two small solid ones. And then we have the bottom of the box. And then here's a, a triad of triads. So we have one really broad U shape, tertiary space within it. Another, then two smaller broad ones, but there's also two smaller ones stacked on top of that. So it's the same kind of thing as these other little triad of U shapes, but they're they're built into a larger thing. But there's no ovoid, there's no further form like excuse me development in that space. And again, this is uh, easily 250 years old. So it would go back into the, probably into the 17th century, if not before that. It's really hard to say, but it's full of archaic features. And then this one, this is a, a different 
chest. This one, I think, comes from the area around cake. Um, also clearly very old, similar to the other one in some ways, the large eye, small, carved out space around it, ovoid shape relief, ovoid relief. In this case, the ovoids are upside down, the flat side is on the top, and a slit relief across. Um, it's just this little triangular secondary space. You can barely tell the difference between the brown form line and the brownish red secondary. Two-step cheek design, but instead of being a solid Red, there's just one trigon that splits that into an upper and a lower set of elements. Um, separate formine for the nostril. And then, so there's a U shape here, another one over here with tertiary space within. The bump of the nose, circle relief, so on. And then instead of just uh, a, an undefined area like this last one we looked at, it just had ovoids and U shaped whatnot down here. This one has a whole other creature. It has what appears to be a, a whale. Here's a blowhole and a, pec, a dorsal fin, excuse me. And then a tail that it's the two and share the same tail. Really a curious shape for the tail, but there it is. It's kind of like a, a round ovoid with a U shape within it. And then tertiary space between the fine line and the form line. Little red pectoral fins extending back from the corner of the jaw and a couple of U shapes within the body with just a slit at the base of each one. Again, uh, broad open eyelid, really small negative space and so on around it. And then the, the lid and the bottom, these older chests always have, or frequently have a really thick lid and a, a really thick bottom as well. If you put the two together, they're broader than the chest itself is. And so this is hollowed out on the inside. The lid's hollowed out on the inside. And then the surface has been grooved very carefully, very deliberately, narrow parallel grooves to texture the surface. And that's a very, very old technique that you, you only see on the oldest uh, things in this tradition. So this one is in the Museum of American Indian. Again, not a big box, bigger than the other two, I believe. If I remember right, this one might be just over two feet wide, really thick top, thick bottom, opercular inlay. I think it's the first example we've seen of that. So the opercular just inlaid flat into the lid. And one big broad head. In this case, cheek design is a little more elaborate. It's a two-step design. The other ones we looked at just had solid red areas, maybe a trigon or a slit uh, to embellish them. But here we've got a, an ovoid with an eye within it and a little like half the leg of the U shape extending up to the corner of the nostril. First step, second step. The ovoid just fits in that space with a little crescent shape there and a tail extending up the back of the eye socket, another crescent here. Just a slit for the nostril opening, a vertical oval hollowed out. And then the eyes elaborated, not just an inner ovoid, an ovoid shaped relief, but this is the first time we've really seen an elaborated inner ovoid. So it's got an eye socket, it's got a snout and it has a mouth. So it's what a lot of people would call a salmon trout head. 
And that's an interesting term by itself. Uh, Emmons recorded a term from somebody. He said, is there a name for this? And a person told him a name that translated as looks like the head of a salmon trout, whatever a salmon trout is, but it looks like the head of a fish. Um, and so it, it looks like the head of a, something, but, but it isn't that something. So uh, it, it's not a salmon trout head, but that's what the name is, is sort of stuck to it for whatever reason. And here again, we can see that instead of being the deepest part, the center of these trigon eyelids is the, one of the, is the higher spot and it's lower on each edge. So that this, the white of the eye, so to speak, is domed instead of carved down where the others were the older ones we saw that that was the deepest part of the cup. Slit relief in the eye almost non-existent area around it, almost nothing top and bottom and just on either side of the eyelid line to help raise the fine line around the eye and the same heavily overlapped wide form line here, inner ovoid, ovoid relief, uh, trigon of the triad, excuse me, of U-shapes here between this Ovoid and upper corner, we've lost the, the appearance of a head up here. And we just have the ovoid and a little extension with a triangular sort of tertiary space there. But there's nothing really to indicate a separate head. So this has become conventionalized without the same representational quality that the other ones had, like this, where it was clearly another head up there. So now we just have the ovoid and not the whole head or this one, we just have the old one, and not the whole head. And then um, again, triad of these shapes here, two solids and so on. Uh, this one is also in the Museum of American Indian, really spectacular chest. And In some ways, okay. um, it's similar to the others in that the main head is on the bottom and there's nothing below it. Here we actually have the plumb line come down and it does exist. It's not completely eliminated down here, but it's way narrower than it might have been. And we have a two-step thing going on with just a U-shape and a trigon within it. So here, this is somewhat elaborated, not as much as the last one. And then double eyes, I think that's the first time we've seen double eye inner ovoid. So it's like a frontal face, but it's just two eyes and a mouth, that's it. Corn line drops down between the eye sockets, comes all the way down to the lower jaw, no cheek designed separate. And then ovoids for the nostrils with just a slit in them and then hollowed around that. So that the slit is high, edges of the slit are on the surface and the edge around that is lowered down. Small circle relief trigon between the two, two squashed down U shapes in the mouth with a broad tertiary area above them hollowed out. And what amounts to a triad of U shapes over here on the side, the broad one here overlap the upper line of the jaw, which becomes the lower line of this head on top of the main head. So again, we have the really representational form of another head. She even has teeth all the way across so it's a huge mouth going all the way across the top. And then an eye socket there with a profile inner ovoid in it. And uh, just a, a crescent there and a form line coming around to create the jaw and the mouth line on both ends. And just a U-shape with an extension or two 
coming back from the head and a U shape with just a fine line around it, hollowed out, and what appears to be two tertiary elements between. Then there's another spectacular thick lid. This is a quite a bit bigger box. If I remember right, I'd say it was about 30 inches wide, maybe a little more. Um, big, thick lid, not quite as thick as some of them on the bottom, but it appears that it's also a telescoping box because of the gap that you can see here. So this, the sides of the box that we see are attached to the lid. And then in addition to the opercular inlay, there's some great little small opercular and rectangular area cut out with a very mask-like face within it. So it not only has separate eyebrow and lips and all that, it's actually relief carved like a little flat mask that's looking out from a rectangular window, spectacular thing, this. And so in terms of the evolution of the design, that probably in some ways is what you might call older than this one, because this has lost the head in the upper corner, head in the lower corner concept where um, that we saw even here. But it, it's hard to know and hard to know exactly where this was made. But it's a very, very early style. Um, and then um, this one is in the same sort of age ballpark. But you notice that, in a way, excuse me for jumping around, the four lines are getting smaller, not as wide. So here we have the same structure dip in the middle, one line comes all the way down to form the lower jaw. Now the main head is on the top instead of on the bottom. And we have an ovoid in the upper corner. And this isn't that much different from these where there's the ovoid and then a little, just a little hint of a beak here. So this one, where am I now? Da -da -da. Here. And this one, the ovoid is there. There's a U shape up in the corner. And there's an extension this way, but it's not a literal head. This isn't nearly as beak like looking. It's just like half of the U shape there, so that the tertiary space within it tapers down. Crescent here. Another crescent with the, the base of the U shape here. And then the form line at the bottom of the ovoid comes all the way back. Little crescent there and down to touch the corner of this hole. But down here, there's not a separate head or a separate creature like we saw in that other one. It's just a conventionalized ovoid in the upper corner, ovoid in the lower corner, and then a body line. However, we see the similar triad of U shapes here, absolutely square corner. But instead of just one broad tertiary area, here we have two round cornered tertiary U shape with a fine line at the base, all it out painted blue. And then a little, just a kind of S shaped form line to uh, create an arm, then a a bird like foot with three talons and a thumb. And this is just tilted enough to create a little half of a tapering U shape below here, small crescent, and so on. So, this, this is a, it, it appears to illustrate a, a, a movement toward thinner form lines, but we still are retaining the small negative spaces. So these ovoids almost fill that space. The eyes almost fill that space. And then um, here in the two-step cheek design, it's just a U-shape pierced within it to give it some character. So it's like there's one line with a U-shape attached to it 
the tip of which bends up into the corner. Single U shape with a little extension that has both a crescent and a little circle relief. Fine line at the base and then the tertiary space hollowed out. And it appears that the whatever was blue in this oxidized in some way and became really dark. I don't know how to explain that, but that's the way the surface looks on this one. How are we doing for time? Are we past time or are we doing okay? Oh, we're past time, but you can keep going if you want. It's very interesting. <laughs> Kind of up to you if you want to wind it up. Along here. But so just to, to note it without getting into the detail, here again we can see another step in the direction of thinner form lines. So there's more elements involved here, the same basic structures, the ovoid in the upper corner, but not a head, ovoids in the lower corner, but not a part of a separate creature. But here there's a mask-like face in the body and little arm, like a shoulder and arm and a foot. And a more elaborate, not just the triad of U-shapes, but an ovoid and a whole little form line construction in each side here and more elaborate here as well. So because the form lines are narrower, Although the tertiary areas are still quite small, there's more room for elaboration in the same amount of space. So we still have a broad head, in this case, across the top, and a body area across the bottom. But in order to make more room for all these other elements, the form lines are narrow. And so we can see that same trend happening here, only more abruptly. So here we got the, the same structure of the head, form line dips in the middle, comes down, turns toward across the bump, big bend in it. It's not just straight across. The, this dynamic of the arch within the rectangular form is coming up where some of these would go back by the, there's a little arch there and the two eye sockets in parallel. Uh, so the, ten, the idea was there but uh, down here, it's a much, um, much more uh, evident and more elaborated arc through the whole thing. So now, even though it's the same structure, we have all the way up and over and over there. There's no head up here. There's no other creature down here. There's a body with a leg that becomes a leg and a secondary foot. But now, what else is going on? There's a little more room around the eye and the eye socket. There's a little more room around the inner ovoid. And particularly these smaller ones, there's a very small inner ovoid compared to the size of the circular space around it. Same with these, same with these. This is a much smaller inner ovoids than a broader negative space around them. And here in the same two-step cheek design, Instead of just one big solid red thing, like we saw in those older ones, the artist has built this into a complex of U shapes with even a sub secondary U shape that instead of solid black is cross hatched. Then there's a negative ovoid built sideways into the end of that U shape. So it just kind of nestles in the corner, trigon and the extension coming up to complete. The eye socket, because of the tip in it, that little triangular space is wider at the bottom than others that we've seen. And here within the body, there's two eyes and a mouth, even has teeth and two ears. So this is what some people, I think it was Robert Davidson, sometimes referred to as mighty mouse, um, because it has tall ears, but uh, round inner ovoid with a lot of space around it, round inner ovoid with a lot of space around it, you know, each of these elaborated secondary areas. So here's another 
corner oriented box, like the one that we looked at that was very old. So that in itself is an old tradition. And here's how it works out. So the center of the design is on the corner and we have two profiles of that design on these two corners. The other side of the box or the corner of the box has another design bent around the corner on that side. So we can see this as the same kind of structure. The corn line that dips down in the middle, comes down, becomes the lower jaw, separate mouth, separate nostril. But look how much, where before, you come up here, and the form lines almost really fill the space, and the cut out areas are very small. Down here, we've got small form lines, very small form lines, with a great so there's more negative space here than there is positive form line space, the positive primary or secondary, even the secondary form lines are quite thin. So that in that two-step cheek design where once we saw just a solid red area, now it's a very skinny leg U-shape coming all the way back to here, circle the leaf in the corner, small little extension coming up and the whole interior of that is now a fine line defined tertiary space. So now there's more unpainted space than there is painted space. It's the exact opposite proportion of what we we're looking at before. And so this, we've seen this tendency working in this direction. And, uh, and now at this time, which is probably the first half of maybe right around the middle of the 19th century by the time we arrive at this kind of proportion of design so that inner ovoids are smaller relative to the form line around them like this one like this one and there's just way more negative space and that continues in this direction with this uh, example, I'm not trying to get rid of these so we can, I hate this. <clears throat> so same thing, then it's the same structure we looked at, same head, this one is not the double eye type, it's the single where the form line comes around and turns down. But look how skinny the whole thing is, very thin across the top, thin, thinner on the side and way down to well, you know, hardly a line there on this side, but it still turns down, tapers to a point. And then red cheek design, but it's not a solid red area. It's a very slim red line here with two skinny leg red U shapes extending down into the rest of the cheek area. Two simple skinny leg U shapes on each side with a little feather like extension cross hatched over in the top corner, but no head. It's just, it's become uh, conventionalized. There's just an ovoid in the top corner, ovoid in the lower corner, in this case with a profile, mask-like face, face-like structure in the middle, two eyes, ovoids, kind of like a snout, another U-shape coming down. A lot of area around the inner ovoid and the fine line around it. A lot of area within this skinny leg U shape. Skinny leg U shapes in here where we, before and other times we've seen more elaborate stuff going on. And we get to here and now there's more blue in the tertiary spaces that are negative or carved away there's more blue than there is black and red. So it was really gone to the complete opposite. Now this is a Hiltzup chest Bella Bella from Millbank Sound area. 
but it goes to show how in, in some places the artists were willing to uh, alter the tradition, at least in the direction of the width of the form lines, but not in terms of the overall structure. So we still have ovoid in the upper corner, but not, not as a head, ovoid in the lower corner, but not as a separate creature. And large complexes of form lines within the body and on either side of the head, but each of those contains a lot of negative space. Look how tiny that inner ovoid is within that huge negative space. So that's really the opposite of what we were looking at before. And we can see that in other things. This is a painting by my friend Joe David of a chest front that has those, it's not just like any existing chest front, but it, it reflects the style of thin form lines that we saw in that other object. And I'd like to skip down here to see something similar happening just in spruce root hats. So this is a spruce root hat collected by Malaspina in 1791 at Yakutat. Broad, not very tall hat, as you can see. And instead of just the chain here from three strand twining to skip stitch, self pattern twining, there's, there's diagonal lines in this direction, then they switch this direction and back in the other direction. So that's really interesting with double rows of three strand separating each of those textured areas. And then the only painted area is here in the top. And so this is a go home for a particular exhibition uh, like that other one. He worked out the design in black and white with black and red form line. So that's what this painting is. So here's this big ovoid and new shape here with this split view of the tertiary split within the, in this case, it's painted red, like the secondary view. And then the eye socket, but the lower jaw is not there. So the, the, this, the lower jaw is overlapped by this self-pattern twining. And uh, so the form line comes up over the eye socket down, but there is no lower jaw extending around under here. It's implied, but to add it in there would have just reduced the amount of space available for this. So the artist decided, never mind, we know it's there, we don't need to paint it. And then long, narrow, but very elaborated inner ovoid, tiny eye with long eyelid points, which is an early characteristic as well. Same thing here. But in terms of space available, those are broad form lines. So the top and the bottom form line are about as broad as the space within the eye socket itself. So this is definitely old style. And who knows how old this was in 1791. That's just when it was collected, not when it was made. So if it was 50 years old then, from the 1740s, that's not unexpectable or out of the question. So here's another approach to a hat painting where they decided to go all the way from the peak to the rim, never mind the, the change in texture. So the three stand twining just comes to here. So it, it's not echoed in, in any border of the design itself. The design goes right across that border and fills the space. So there's a head here, another face-like structure here. And then on the other side of it, here's the head and the two heads. And here's like the body and a broad split out wheel-like tail. And these are, medium weight form lines with uh, uh, relatively small negative areas. So the inner ovoids here are fairly large. 
and the tertiary space around them is small. So we're going back into that early 19th, late 18th century style of form line proportion. So a very complex design. And here's red form lines for the uh, claw like foot. And then we can contour. And so this is first, at least first half of the 19th century, if not right around 1800. And then a whole nother way of looking at a hat. This is a Charles Edenshaw painting, modest spruce root hat from either the late 19th century or early 20th. And so here, the previous one is what um, in his book, I think he even used this one as the illustration. Uh, in, Bill Holmes book, he referred to this as a distributed style of design, meaning it's distributed across the whole space. You don't really see the outline of a creature. It's sort of blended into the whole form line pattern. But here, he would call this, uh, we had three class one, distributed, expansive, and configurative. So, this is somewhere between expensive and configurative because he defined configurative as something where you see the outline of the creature and it's fairly naturalistic proportions and it's it's not tied to the shape of the space it's in. And there are a lot of other examples of that besides these kind of hats. But so this is sort of more like expansive in that you can see the outline of the frog head, front leg, back leg, but it's been filled out and proportioned, not proportioned like a naturalistic frog, but proportioned like a frog that fits in this big circular space. So some of each. But if we look, if we're looking at just the form line structure, how, and if you just went by the perimeter of the frog, there's still probably more negative space than there is painted form line space. So these big U shapes are very narrow, relatively narrow form line for the overlaid around the foot. And then a small inner ovoid, even if that was solid, it would be relatively small with a lot of space around it. But it's elaborated using the same proportion. So it's a very thin form line ovoid with a very small inner ovoid, a lot of space around it, and a narrow U shape with a lot of negative space within that. The eye up here, the eye socket's got a lot of space around the eye. Same with the eye collaboration itself, just ovoid and U shape and a very small inner ovoid at that. Red lips and a form line that comes all the way around and touches the corner. No separate cheek design at all. It's just uh, part of the eye socket in a way. No elaboration within the body. The body is just a U shape that connects the head and the hips. Uh, same thing going on here. Here, a U shape that becomes the leg with the foot at the end of it. So U-shape starts out here and ends here. Ordinarily the U-shape would come all the way to here, right? But here he's, he's done double duty there where the foot carries the line of the U-shape up to here. But it's, it's not really the side of the U-shape, it's the foot. So really imaginative uh, use of the form line system is another Eden Shaw hat Raven design, but again, lots of background space. He's used the red fine line to surround the whole thing and to sort of make a design out of the negative spaces. You got that red form line there, red dashing here. Uh, relatively narrow form lines compared to the spaces they surround. So it's a continuation of that 
trend in the design style that um, creates other possibilities, meaning uh, here's a, a design that fills a space, but not completely so that it's easy to see the outline of the raven's head, easy to see the outline of the wing. It, it's not absorbed into a, a complete form line structure that goes all the way out to the rim, as was the case in this example. So it's really interesting to see how these trends have worked out. And the change happened over like just a century period. Uh, if you look at design from 1800, like we were earlier, and, and you come up to ones like this that are close to 1900, that in that 100 year period, a tremendous amount of change happened over a huge area. So some of those older things we were looking at were Tlingit in origin, some were Haida probably. Uh, and the very oldest ones we looked at came from uh, the Simchian area, or at least what was historically Simchian in the uh, Prince Rupert Harbor area. I forgot to mention that uh, this, the chest, I believe this is the one from Cake, and it was uh, carbon dated. I believe the wood was carbon dated, or something in the chest was carbon dated. That came out to be 600 years old. And carbon dating can be fickle, it's not always uh, definitively accurate, but uh, it suggests that this could be way older than we think. I've been saying 18th century, but that uh, 600 years would be what? 1400? So the change happened over a long period of time and was accelerated in some areas more than others. So that's the end of my story. Thank you all who stuck around to the end, and uh, I hope uh, we've seen these things from another point of view that we might not have had earlier. And uh, thank you very much for your interest and your attention. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. There, a lot of people appreciated this lengthy discussion, and the fact that you were able to go on at your own pace. People learn a lot <laughs> from this. It's, it's great that way. Um, we do have one question that came in okay. through the chat. Um, and so the okay. question is, is the evolution of form line from a more uniform thickness in antiquity towards a more extreme stylization part of the evolution of tools and greater use of metal blades? Well, that's an interesting question. And I think um, that might play a part in it because surely if we go back to something uh, as early as say that uh, winding tool, clearly this could have been done with much more primitive tools than say some of these um, carvings like this, you know? Um, and maybe those tools help to accelerate that change. Um, I think that's a firm possibility. Uh, but it's also the case in designs that are just painted and not carved. So uh, there's a little bit of both going on, right? Um, some of it is just a conceptual difference and, and some of it is definitely related to tools may not have been driven by the tools but were certainly uh, enabled by the change in tool technology as more sophisticated knives and whatnot came into use I think that's a good good point to bring up and I appreciate the question
Well, thank you again for a very uh, learned discussion and of the fine points of many of these pieces. Um, SHI invites viewers to return for our next lecture by Dr. Steve Langdon, entitled Cultural Relations Among the Haida, Clinkett, and Simsian Societies, which will be broadcast on Thursday, January 21st at noon. That's this coming Thursday. We have a link below the YouTube video for a survey we hope you will take a moment to complete. This will help us to continue improving our lecture series and also allow our funders to measure the impact of the program. SHI has started construction of its arts campus in downtown Juneau, which will expand opportunities for education and art. If you are interested in making a donation to the arts campus, please visit calaskaheritage.org slash campus. Thank you and see you on Thursday. Thank you, Chuck. Sure enough. Yeah.